So we're rounding the corner. Um, so my job is to set a little bit of context before we go into the conversation. When we were putting this together, we thought about looking at the notion of transformation and the people side of transformation through three lenses, an artistic lens, um, a scientific lens, and a design lens. So we don't talk about time or agendas. We talk about flow. And so we're, we're roughly thinking that the flow will go something like Inamar will talk a little bit about his experience in dynamic transformation, working with and through human beings in his role as executive director at Palabalus. Then Neil will come in and talk about his experience in applying science to really deal with this dynamic transformation of human capital that we're seeing. And then Susan will talk uh, about how empathy and this whole notion of how we really have to be human-centered in all our approaches can move beyond product and service and into design for change. Um, then we have a hypothesis that whatever they talk about, there'll be some synergies, and we'll start to think about how do we actually pull themes out of this that could be instructive for us as we think about in corporations, how we go about doing that. And then finally, we're going to uh, have a lightning round where we say, well, how does this land back on top of the People Manifesto, which Rick just uh, alluded to? Um, because it is all about people. I think that's been a, something we've been talking about all day long, and just just to quote, uh, or to look at where we are today, I, this got stolen. I had this all set up with a quiz and everything else, but th that is uh, Jack Welsh back in, in the year 2000 in the um, annual report said, if the, if the rate of change on the outside is faster than the rate of change on the inside, the end is near. If you can't maintain synchrony with the environment within which you operate, you will kind of regress to a mean of mediocrity. And so those are the top 10 global companies in the year 2000. And so, little thought experiment for you is how many are left and what patterns do you see? The pattern is oil. Uh, seven out of 10 of them have to do with making oil or putting oil into products that use them. And what's happened over the last 6,800 days of creative destruction is, number one, the tenure of a company has gone from 60 years down to 18 years on the, on the, on the indices. Uh, w since 1919, when there was 30 companies on the, on the Dow Jones Index, 54 have flipped in and out, so one flips every two years. And this is actually Martin Reeves' work, but uh, the average lifespan of a company today has gone from 50 years down to 31.6. So the average human being in the United States lived till 78. So the idea of staying with a company for your whole life doesn't quite work anymore because companies are dying faster than humans. Uh, and so then if we look at the list today, we've kind of migrated from kind of oil to data being the new oil, and the top seven of, seven of these companies are, are all about data and platforms, which you heard a lot about today. The, the key thing, though, is what's underneath all of this is human beings. And it's, we are paradoxically, Inamar and I were talking about this earlier, we're paradoxically kind of the most flexible part of the system because our, our, our routines can allow us to adapt and evolve. But at the same time, we're all, I think, feeling the collective crush. So what we want to do is we want to kind of stand back a little bit and be a little bit more anthropological and take a look through an art lens where Itamar is going to talk a little bit about a dance company, a dance company that's been around for 50 years, which is really, really hard to do. And if you want to talk about a competitive industry, you want to talk about creative industry where you have to just reimagine yourself over and over and over again, <laughs> and some of the principles that they have adhered to since they were born, and that anybody who becomes a part of Palabalus learns, and how those kind of activate this group creativity and co-creativity that allows this phenomenal um, enterprise to just keep on keeping on and moving well beyond dance. So for those of you who don't know Palabalus, just indulge us for a quick minute, and then I'll turn it over to Itamar to talk about his experience as executive director. But hold on to your hats. Here we go. Palabalus is all about fun. What is Palabalus? The official definition is a sun-loving fungus that lives in cow dung. <laughs> but Palabalus is also the name of a dance company that has mixed inventiveness with humor and thrived even with the name for more than 30 years. I don't think there's a choreographer going, none of them will admit it of course, who hasn't been affected by the reach that Palabalus has taken to what is possible in the shapes and forms of the human body. During this year's Academy Awards, a billion people watched as 
12 performers tumbled across the stage to recreate scenes from Oscar-nominated movies. Didn't you love that? Yeah. That was so fantastic. I think some of the pleasure people take from watching our work is this is not just a group of performers engaged in only a personal search. There's a, there's a psychological and a social interaction that is somehow um, idealistic. Wonderful thing with Palabolos is they really seem to know what they're doing, you know, so they have it kind of together and they know that one way or another, by God, even if Spiegelman gets lost, we'll just drag him back and we'll just keep walking, you know? Working with Palabolos is really great. I mean, it's, it's sort of organized chaos. If someone has a solution, they feel comfortable as sort of a family calling it forth. There is nothing in this bit we put together with Palabolos that the two of us can do. There's not one moment, there's not one trick. These people have become like family to me, but in the best sense of the word, the family that you choose because you just love their creative spirit and their minds and their brains and their bodies, and it's just the best. That's kind of cool. I want to be you, man. <laughs> um, no, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> We've talked about that. So look, um, <clears throat> we have I've had the opportunity to collaborate with you a couple of times, and if you want to experience what we're about to talk about, there is the strategy event later on today. But the first thing Itamar wrote to me is, um, we don't like to plan in advance, we like to do it as we go. And when you're organizing an event like this, it's like, okay, because it, it's emergent and it has to happen. And that comes from a number of these principles that kind of are core, they're in the DNA of Palapos. Could you just tell us what, you've been dynamically transforming for 50 years, the organization has. How does this come to life for real every day on the, on the dance floor uh, up, in your, up in Connecticut? Um, it's interesting. You know, I think innovation for us, the margins are so low. It's a nonprofit arts organization. There really is no padding. So innovation becomes an absolute necessity on an ongoing basis for survival. Um, and the brand basically is associated with innovation and our jobs working for the brand are to make sure that we keep coming up with good enough ideas to make it seem like the brand is still doing what it's supposed to be doing. And it turns out that the best way to get there is not to sit and have a tremendous far horizon in terms of what it is that you're doing, but to put people in a room in, for very short periods of time in order to kind of come up with things that are very different from anything you've seen before. So that iteration and improvisation become hugely important in terms of quick innovation and lasting innovation, because you really have to come at things from very different points of view. And it's very hard to do that when you do that by committee. Committees tend to, tend to trend toward the known, not toward the new. And so, in a funny way, I think what we've realized from a management and leadership position is that you kind of have to encourage a certain degree of chaos. And it's so anti-intuitive to try to manage through the encouragement of chaos. But in some sense, you want things to be loose enough for people to be able to have what you might think of as a wild idea. And then you want to have a room that allows those wild ideas to be recognized and for people to actually pursue them. And the core, I think, to that is that the investment of pursuing an idea is always much cheaper than American enterprise generally makes it. So what generally you find in the American enterprise is when someone has an idea that everyone thinks is a good idea, an enormous amount of planning and work and evaluation and research and all of these things are put into it. It turns into committee. It turns into approval fictitious budget spreadsheets that don't really mean anything, but somehow Everyone has to prove to everyone that it's a good idea on paper. As opposed to saying, why don't we take three hours and a bunch of cardboard and just do it in three hours. And we'll know so much more about whether this is a good idea or isn't a good idea in three hours with cardboard than we would if we actually spent an enormous amount of time putting it through all of the stress testing and market justifications and everything that we want in order to initiate something new. So somehow letting go, <laughs> looser hold, less control, less clear planning, more response, more alacrity, allows for a much better survival in today's climate, which is our experience for 50 years, but it feels like 
it's like the revenge of the nerds. We've been saying this for 50 years, and finally people are like, maybe we should do it this way. So it's been very interesting to sort of see the world turn toward a process that we've been cultivating for a long time and to understand that it's actually applicable in many ways to a very efficient process of innovation that can be applied to other fields. Cool. Thanks, Edamore. We'll come back around. But uh, so we saw a little bit of you showy, you dewy, more, more, more do, less talk. So some these, of these all become yeah. essentially rules of thumb, kind of farmer's almanac yeah. kind of ideas that everyone lives with that allows that process to end up generating lucky accidents more reliably than not having them. That's cool. So, so you brought up this organized chaos. It's like it seems in this world that we're, we're living in, um, it, the rate of change is the problem. It's not speed. It's the rate of change. And anybody who's a physics major, it, it's, it's speed. Uh, the next derivative is acceleration. The next derivative is jerk. The next derivative is snap. The next derivative is crackle. And the next derivative is pop. So when we talk about the rate of change, we're actually talking about a much more exponential degree than just things speeding up. And on the other side of the equation is the more connected we become, you go from kind of a simple predictable outcome to a complicated one that might be multivariate, but you can statistically figure out probability paths to complexity where the minute you in interact in the system, you change the system so it's hard to predict ahead of time to chaos. So roughly speaking, the trajectory of uncertainty is heading towards chaos and pop, right? Um, and, and, and we're kind of on this journey and trajectory. And so in a way, leaning into chaos and kind of working back is, is what I'm hearing for you. What does it mean today in a world where um, we're thinking about um, there's huge unemployment, and yet there's not people to fill the jobs. That if we start thinking about the human side of this equation and the fact that the world's moving so fast, and we say, well, gosh, we can't do the upskilling as fast, so now we'll just do uh, you know, an annual income, a basic income for everybody, and that should be fine. This is something that, that Neil really is dealing with, with Allegis, one of the largest staffing companies in the world. And so beyond just the kind of the, the, the mundane of, oh, we need, we need more bodies in the, in the company to do work, et cetera. It's how do we get the man-machine interface correct? How do we leverage technology in the best way possible? These are all the challenges that you're dealing with, Neil. And, and with your permission, I wanted to show a little bit of what a company really looks like, because we tend to think about hiring and headcount and where will they fit and what group will they be in and who's got headcount and who doesn't and who should hire and who, sh who doesn't. This is a fantastic rendering, I think. Autodesk is really good at kind of visualizing data. And what I'd like to do is just show this to you. Uh, this is a, you can find it online. It's called org org chart. And essentially, a couple of the data scientists at Autodesk, they took the human capital data and they basically said each little circle is a human being. If an employee leaves, they add it on. If an employee moves, it moves over. And here you're going to see Autodesk from 2007 to 2011, just to give you a sense of what an organization looks like. So there, in the middle is the CEO, and every node there is a human being. And this is day by day, OK? So, so if we think about a permanent static hierarchical org chart, I mean, it, it, nothing could be further from the truth. And, and all these human beings, carbon-based life forms that are represented in these nodes here, um, it's not static, awesome. right? It's not static. And, and we're, we're about to see here an org shift. So you'll see acquisitions come in, and they come towards the center, and they get pushed out. Boom, there was another acquisition that just came in. You'll see a reorg here, and there's another acquisition that came in and got rejected. Uh, this is culture in action, and it's almost like a, a biological cell. Uh, and, and Neil's job is to kind of help not just Autodesk, but all of their suppliers and everybody else to actually bring the human capital into a system that we might perceive to be really static, but it actually looks like that. So how could he possibly run his organization, it's a good thing he's in charge of digital transformation, <laughs> when his client operates this way? I'm, I'm, my heart is palpitating just thinking about your job. <laughs> but the good news is you've, you've applied science, and you've, you've looked at how you're going to do this, and you've created something really cool, Neil, I think, called Sinner Teams. Would you, would you care to share a little bit of your journey of the Sinner Team incubator story and yeah. how you deal with this reality? Absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm happy to share some of our stories. So we actually lived this change. And I think the first thing we needed to do before we could help our clients is, as we say, eat our own dog food and change our own organization first. Um, so a little bit of our journey, we were um, 
doing quite well. We're in the staffing and recruiting business. It's, it's, it's not rocket science. I mean, we call it get a rec, fill a rec. It's been the same thing for about at least 35 years of existence that we've been in. Um, and then after the financial meltdown, we've been on a growth trajectory that has been unprecedented for us. So we were doing just fine. And about seven years into it, we tend to be a paranoid group. And we kind of looked at each other and said, something's not right. We're, we're way too happy. We're, we're getting real fat. And um, something, something just doesn't feel right. Um, and as you look at the industry we're in, in the last five years, uh, we've never been, as a services company, we've never been more disrupted by technology ever. So in our industry, technology helps create um, a closer, I guess, relationship between the uh, candidate and the hiring manager. And for years, we were the agent in between. And if you can create and take the friction out of that relationship, you can imagine we were feeling pretty marginalized and squeezed out. So um, in 2017, we kind of looked at ourselves and said, we really got to figure out how to change. Um, you know, not just digitize our processes. I mean, the digitization effort was way underway. Um, but most of what we were doing was very internally focused. And it became about operational efficiencies and not really transformation. Um, and those are great if you want to maintain profit margins um, and if you <laughs> want to maintain profitability. But your customers and clients don't really care. Um, you're not bringing any value to them just because you're making more money per head, if you will. So um, we needed to create new ideas. We needed to create new, new products, new services. And we needed a better way to do that. So um, we did what any great organization does, is we basically went out and read everything we could read <laughs> on, on the planet. And, um, and, and basically settled on two management models. One was um, Accelerate by John Cotter. It's a great book. Uh, we needed to figure out how to re-energize the entrepreneurial spirit and entrepreneurial organization against the hierarchies to make them equal on the playing field and get back to our roots. Um, the other was Zone to Win by Jeffrey Moore. So it was very, it, that was probably the most inspirational book to me because it really taught me how to figure out how do we innovate in all the sectors of the organization. Um, I'll channel Ray Dalio a little bit here, and hopefully we can kind of have thoughtful disagreement. But he believes uh, you can't disrupt yourself. Um, disruption happens by using your strengths and going and focusing in somebody else's business and <laughs> creating new businesses for yourself. And um, you know, fighting inertia can be very, very difficult. Um, trying me trying to tell seven presidents that you need to change is a very difficult process. So. We, we settled on those management models, but we basically realized that it doesn't really matter what kind of strategy you have. Um, if you don't really understand who the champions are in your organization, who the change agents are, and to be very honest, who the real leadership is, like who gets S done in your business, um, you're never going to change. And so um, we, uh, we owe a lot to Tony and another consultant who actually opened our eyes to this. But he also recommended, he said, hey, why don't you put a little science to this? And he recommended a consulting company called uh, CL Advisors. And, and they're here. Um, and they have a, a great scientific model called an organizational network analysis, an ONA. And that was kind of the movement that you saw before. And then this is a mapping of us of how work or how things actually get done in our organization. So um, we surveyed the top 900 leaders. We mapped the organization completely. Um, and we re really identified the people that could actually drive change um, through the organization and really make it more transformational than operationally efficient. We then took that data, and we still use it today because I run the incubator. Um, and as we kind of develop new digital business models, we're using those people that we identified in the ONA. And they're actually leading the center teams and do, running very small uh, sprint-based experiments for us. Um, where we can actually try a lot of things. We used to make really big bets, and probably your organizations do. Like we would say, all right, we're going to put $3 million towards this, and hope to God everything was going to work out. Now we run hundreds of experiments at, I don't know, fifty to $70,000 a piece. Um, and we fail fast, we fail forward, um, we learn, we change, we pivot. Um, and it's, uh, we're still in our infancy stages. We've been doing it about a year. But it's really changed the culture of our organization. And there is a real uh, strong grass movement within, within Allegis right now um, to, to try to find that next blue ocean, if you will, so we can go out and slay that billion-dollar whale that everybody wants to go get. <laughs> so that's our story. What I love about Neil is like 
he gets all the business aspects in, but we, we, we got to. I want to pick on one little thing there. The, yeah. the leadership one in the middle, I think, was a bit of a, 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 a revelation for us, where the question we asked was something like, if you're really having to deal with transformation and change, who would you follow? Yeah. And you found some interesting stuff there that there were a bunch of people that the, the group identified as people they would follow that weren't necessarily in your succession plan. Is that right? Yeah, that 50 percent of them weren't even in the succession plan. So it was kind of an unintended outcome that we identified a whole bunch of new leaders. We were like, we've got to get these people really switched on, lit, and kind of engaged in what we're doing. Um, it also did a wonderful thing by, you know, we were able to kind of take um, the hidden leaders and identify what we call the true believers. Um, and basically, we whittled it down to, f there's about 55 people in our organization of 20,000 that really drive 80% of what we do, hmm. which was amazing. So those are the people I spend a lot of time with. You know, I'm on the phone with them, I get them engaged, I show them all the mock-ups we do, because they're believers in change. And it just is kind of viral as it, as it happens through the organization. So um, it's been really cool. The other thing it does is it identifies the skeptics so you know who your enemies are and you know how to treat them. Um, you don't have to like eliminate them, but you, 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 know, you have to like, <laughs> you gotta work with them and you can figure out who the most influential skeptics are, get to them before you actually start to launch something, something transformational or change. Um, and it's, it's, it's made it very seamless. Um, and we're seeing a lot of success. It's still new, but we're pretty excited about it. Cool. So, moving right along, Susan, I mean, I, I don't think IDEO needs much <clears throat> introduction, but clearly it, it, a lot of what we were talking about today, I was sitting beside Susan, and it's like, yes, yes, yes. It's the, it's the empathy part of, of the human system, and truly understanding, literally walking in other shoes and being the anthropologist, if you will. And, and so you're well known for, you know, Dean Hovey and company coming up with the mouse and the chair, and, and you had your Leslie Stahl moment with Palabolus, but so did you with your with your shopping cart, if I remember. Sure, yeah. Um, <laughs> I but remember Susan that. Susan's had kind of a, a strategy role working with Tim for quite some time, and then has kind of stepped that up, kind of again putting things into action, not unlike Neil through something called the Colab. And I've just got a little brief piece on Colab, and then we'll go to Susan in terms of what her experience is, is kind of how we deal with dynamic transformation. It has been an extraordinary week. We have all of these extraordinary member companies that are here really looking at how we can be re-envisioning the food system and applying circular principles to a regenerative future. We're here to take a very audacious but also very intangible concept of circular economy. Uh, we're trying to take that to the next level and actually make it much more tangible and concrete. Circularity is so closely linked with innovation and it's innovation that's the path forward for us as we face really daunting challenges in every aspect of our economy. The huge light bulb was the build, a, build something, build a prototype. It generates so much more positive feedback than, than just an idea which generally gets crushed or they say. Traditionally, talking is so much easier. It's easier to sit around the table and we found ourselves doing that at several points. And so breaking out of that and actually starting to build um, it was kind of a revelatory moment for all of us. So, Susan, um, I had the opportunity to come up to, to Boston with you in CoLab and, and kind of, I don't know, think about redesigning government policy, right? And, and so we've gone from empathic design for products through empathic design for service and then even into empathic design for change, you know, for organizations. But you, you're really, with CoLab, if I get it right, it's, it's almost an ecosystem application of empathic design to, to, to change systems. Am I overreaching there? Or? No, absolutely. And it's, uh, it's very exciting to talk about this here today, hearing a lot of the comments earlier on from Rita, Marshall, so many great folks that have inspired our thinking to get to, to, to sit on the stage with you all. Um, I'll start a little bit maybe in the here and now, Tony, and yeah, talk sure. about Colab and what we're up to today. And then if we have a couple of moments at the end, I'll tell you a little bit about the journey of doing change work at IDEO and how IDEO thinks about uh, dynamic transformation. 
Colab is um, a new venture inside of IDEO that's been around for about five years. Um, and our tagline is that we're a platform for collaborative innovation. And what makes that special is that instead of working with an organization in a one-on-one -on -one capacity, doing a consulting project for them, we actually bring stakeholders to the table from startups, nonprofits, uh, corporations of all size, and, and governments in some cases. Um, and they're willing to work together, um, and they're willing to have, for the most part, open IP agreements and learn faster. And so so what's really phenomenal about this is that um, if you think about it, so many of these systemic problems are so difficult to know where to start. And there are very few places where groups can come together and actually make things and prototype things and try to make real concrete progress. Um, and so the, the COLA was almost an accidental idea. Um, you know, IDEO forever in, in the 40 years it's been around has been asked to work on the future of something. Um, and at some point, uh, our two co-founders got kind of bored of answering that question. They realized that all the technologies and things they were being asked to grapple with were getting ever more complicated than ever. Um, and it was frankly just kind of um, wasteful and resource intensive to do that for one organization when most of that stuff just might sit on a shelf in a binder and not get used. And so this idea of bringing people together and learning about the same hard problem was really at the core of Colab. What this looks like today is that we're increasingly taking on um, uh, societal problems through the lens of edge technology, uh, tackling them with stakeholders from every aspect. So in the food video, you saw people from every corner of the system coming together to tackle a really difficult change, like the move from a linear um, destructive economy to a circular regenerative economy. And so we're looking at um, ways that emerging technology can get applied to problems that matter to our members. Um, and so the last thing I'll say about Colab from my experience working with that team is that there's three dimensions to this that really, really resonate in terms of transformation. The first I've already hit on, which is that a lot of the R&D process nowadays is inherently wasteful. Most of these uh, big ticket, expensive research projects that people embark on don't need to be proprietary. There is a time and a place for having patents and IP and things like that, but for the most part, the learning journeys that were going on actually were able to go on with other people and will be far more effective. We'll be able to learn quicker and make faster if we actually bring other people into that conversation. The second pillar is really informed actually by some of Rita McGrath's work who we heard this morning about the concept of arena and competition. The lines between industries are really blurring and it's actually um, increasingly difficult to really innovate if you stay within your guardrails. And so by working together with executives from different sectors, you're much more likely to have a groundbreaking insight about a blind spot or something that you've failed to, to, to realize. Um, and the third dimension to all of this is frankly the thing that's probably the most core in IDEO's DNA, which is making and prototyping and expressing ideas in, in new formats. Um, I like to think of a phrase I heard describing the, the, the golden age of scenario planning from the 1960s at Shell with our Ari Geis and those guys, this idea of helping people create glimpses from the future, right? Creating visceral expressions and prototypes of things that are so compelling and moving that we can't unsee them. And not only might we as researchers and designers see them, we can then go bring executives and rank and file employees into a context where they can also see those things and, and be moved by them. Um, so that's some of what we're up to. It's incredibly exciting. I think it, it really works when we have great partners and like-minded organizations who are willing to come and work with us. And uh, we think we're just at the beginning of a very next exciting chapter for, for IDEO with this. I just want a quick follow-up with you on that one, though. Um, because when we were speaking now, you're saying there's another one coming up and like demand is really high. Uh, but another thing you said to me that really kind of drove home was uh, they know that it's about the process, not the outcome. They're not necessarily saying, I'm going to hold you accountable to come up with. Neil might if he was in one of these, like, where's my next billion dollar whale? But in general, they're saying it's the process and then the curation of bringing people together and then the empathic inquiry, the shared empathic inquiry. That's what they're coming for? Is that right? Yes, that's definitely fair to say. Um, in some cases, there is a direct through line through. So typically, in these cases, we're working in, in one week design spills, uh, sprints. And there are examples of products that have been commercialized very quickly and very profitably, right? An opportunity that we saw years ahead of the market in the case of one product. And so we definitely, for some uh, customers and partners, need those case studies and we need the rigor and we need the metrics. Um, but for the most part, people are approaching this as an innovation portfolio. And they're realizing that when they're sending people to these sprints or to be on these teams, they're getting home runs either directly or indirectly, and they're learning far faster. So really, 
things like the Colab are helping them um, build a culture of fast learning and design at a scale that would just be impossible through a traditional transformation project. So I think that answers your question. It it's does. As much about the process as any product they would create. So now we're at the part of the uh, conversation where um, this is what I call the MOH cloud. This is the miracle occurs here. So in those conversations, um, I'm just going to kind of let my mouth speak without thinking too much. But one of the patterns that I saw immediately was this notion of quick iterative sprints. Neil, you've gone from the three million thing down. Yep. Uh, Itamar, you're like, if we're going to come up with Shadowland, that could have literally come up in a three hour thing with some cardboard and look at what it's done, so to speak. And I think even, Susan, with you, at an ecosystem level, it was even there in the video that said, it's amazing when you build things. Like, let's not spreadsheet the idea. Let's see what the thing is, because in the, in the making of the thing, our shared sense of understanding gets better. So any, any comments about, it's easy to say, but practically, maybe Neil, you first. You've gone from, we invest $3 million, and we have these big kind of I'm sure a stage gate process, and now you're, you know, every time I talk to you, man, it's crazy, it's great, I love it, but it's so different. Can you, can you, what does that feel like inside a, a big organization? Uh, scary, lonely, chaotic. Yeah. Because um, you're always fighting against a hierarchy a little bit, you know? Um, but, I mean, the whole point of it is to really be able to learn. I think Anna said that yeah, earlier. Yeah. And, um, because, I mean, you can have the best laid out plans in the world, and then as soon as it hits the real world, I mean, it all goes to hell, right? I mean, we all know that. So it's like you better be able to pivot quickly um, and, and, and um, kind of absorb and synthesize those learnings and, and issues in front of you right away. Um, and it's going to take you in the right direction. If you have smart people and you have people that are really switched on that really want to get it done, they're going to take it and kind of fold it into the process or product or whatever you're doing, and they're going to move another direction. I mean, it, you just the organization has to accept and allow that to happen. You know, so you don't get tissue rejection. And um, you know, my boss is in the in the audience, and he's been a big advocate for this. And you know, I report directly up to him, so he he is the president of the presidents. So I get a lot of leeway. They set us up outside the organization. Um, you know, we don't even follow the procurement processes. I've got a merry band of misfits of about 11 people, <laughs> and we're just in there doing stuff. You know, and then we use that network, or we call the volunteer army, to go out and help execute for us. You know, so and they're all loving it, and not one of them that I talk to is an executive. You know, so. Do you think yes or no answer? Just so I can get to the others. Uh, if you didn't know who to go to in that ONA, that it would be as, as successful? In other words, the skeptics or the followers? or uh, It's hard to know because we can't empirically test it. It's hard to know. It would take so much longer because I'd ah. spend so much time trying to find the right person. Gotcha. The data kind of brought that to me and said, these are the people. Got it. You know? And, and they're, they're of varied backgrounds because it's just the way data works, right? It's, it's agnostic, right? So they just pulled these people. I mean, I have marketing people, finance people, sales people, operations people, and it's just a, a, a cross section of the, of the, it's almost like a microcosm of the organization. So I can go to anybody I need, whether it's in legal or, and I don't have to sell them on the idea. They're already bought in to change. Yeah. That, that saves a tremendous amount of time. Gotcha. Yeah. Itamar, so you come up with Shadowland or any of those other wonderful productions you do, or you design a scoreboard. I mean, we can't even get into the other creative services that you do, or the fact that you, you're building a whole community up there in Connecticut. But have you actually ever really done the same performance twice? Be, be honest. Like, if, if I go down to Deepak and I see it one day, if, if they're operating on these principles, are you, are you, are you is it like a, uh, a piano concerto where you're trying to hit every note? Or if you really look at it, is it in the same ilk, but different each time? Because it's driven by the, by the principles. Do you see my question? Yeah. Are you I, dynamically I, transforming all the time? <clears throat> <laughs> to some degree, live performance necessitates that. Because you're always in some kind of reactive state where things go wrong, people need to be coordinated, things don't always go the same way. And as we always say, the only difference between technology and people is that technology does a really bad job of covering up its mistakes. <laughs> mm. Whereas people are pretty good if you slip at making it look like <laughs> I meant to do that. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a huge asset 
to working on a people-based thing is that things that didn't go the way they were planned can still go really, really well. And with technology, when things don't go the way they were planned, it usually doesn't go that well. Um, so I think part of what we are looking for is to keep the mindset of our dancers in an optimal place. There's an enormous, we believe there's an enormous undervaluing of the noise of mindset that actually prevents the person that you hired who's terrific at what they do from providing you with the service for which you hired them because there's something really small that's just ruining their day over and over again <laughs> that is the last thing you'd think about as having the impact on the bottom line. And so ultimately, how a person feels when they're doing their job turns out to have an enormous impact on what the productivity of that person is. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, that redounds directly to the bottom line. And it's a weird kind of indirect thinking to try to understand that unless you're really getting people to be their best selves in the job, you're not getting the job that you hired them to do. And it's a very important part of what we spend time thinking about because you both have a certain kind of iterative improvisational process to get to good ideas. Shadowland, for example, an ad executive who was working for Hyundai in Texas called me up and said, could you make a car commercial without a car in it? <laughs> and I said, could we have a sheet to hang up so that we could make shadows behind the sheet. He said, well, I don't see why not. And then we tried it, and we ended up making a car commercial. It wasn't our idea. It, wasn't, it was a guy in Texas who was an executive for Hyundai. <laughs> and then once it got executed, we realized we had stumbled into a completely new way of making something. And then very shortly after that, the Academy Awards called and said, we just saw this car commercial. Oh my god, can you do x? And then you kind of get more input and data of someone else going, this is really, we guys, I think we may have stumbled into something. Mm -hmm. And that led to, you know, essentially over the next 10 years, the company selling $150 million of shadows. Wow, you just I did feel a like I'm a shadow artist. salesman, you know what I mean? Like I feel like I just <laughs> sell shadows. It. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. That's cool, yeah. right? Yeah. Listen, um, the clock says zero, which really sucks cuz I want to keep talking to Ricardo standing there. Before we we go, we we have a couple of questions here that oh. I would just okay. go sure. quickly uh, sure. through them so we can interact. So the first one it's uh, it's for you Susan. It's how do you in IDEO, establish and keep a psychological safety environment mm. to stimulate ideas and interactions freely without losing productivity. Awesome. Um, we work really hard on this, and I think it's a, I mean, it could be a whole, a whole other talk, um, but I'll, I'll give a quick summary. Um, we have our cultures and, and values, which we really um, work hard to uphold. We actually didn't write them down for 30 years. So if the person who asked this question is interested, I can find me in the break and I'll, I'll send you a link to them. But um, we have our values, which we um, both use with each other. We call each other out in real time if people are not upholding them. We've actually integrated them into our career journeys. Um, that's one really important dimension of protecting psychological safety, um, as well as kind of a system we call the flights system for culture, which is um, an onboarding journey into any project or program. It has a pre-flight, a mid-flight, and a post-flight. And we have um, really trained kind of Sherpas, mentors, spiritual people that are going to help you have conversations about how you're working together. Um, because this is such a critical thing that it, we can't exist without the psychological safety to take risks and to innovate. And so um, a, lot, a lot of time is spent in an IDEO project space or office or on the client side actually having discussions about how we're doing and how we're feeling. Um, I think my own training uh, in, in T groups and doing interpersonal dynamics was a, was a big help when I came to IDEO in being able to sort of read the energy in a room. Mm -hmm. And I think if you like that sort of uh, mindful leadership, it's, uh, it's, you know, it's hard work, but it's a really fantastic place to, 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 to spend part of your career. Thank you. Uh, the second question is, chaos is a raw material for a new organization of things, right or wrong? 
So what, what is your answer? There is no, no one they suggested to answer, so. Is chaos good, bad? Does it help us, does it not? If it's there, we have to respond. You like the chaos piece, Inamar. Seems like chaos is not the goal, though. Right. <laughs> yeah. It's not like, let's make it chaotic. It's just a creative room tends to feel chaotic. Oh. But a chaos is a byproduct of, of a intention. certain kind of free thinking that one often tries to shut down because it feels out of control. And often we find that the kind of chaotic process finds a way organically to kind of come to a point. Mm. It's not forever. Neil, are you, because I know when I talk to you, are you feeling this kind of, when we chat, and now I'll just declare it publicly on the whole live stream, but you're kind of like, it's pretty chaotic, but it's Very. cool. <laughs> but that's not how it used yeah, to well, be. Yeah, well, chaos ago. creates, is, is creativity, right? So, I mean, it's like harnessing that chaos and using it in a positive way to create new things for your organization. That's, mm. that's, that's the beauty of it. And, you know, being okay with the white space and the chaos is, is where you've got to be if you really want to do something fantastic and new. Um, so, I mean, I, I think it's amazing. Um, you got to have the right mindset for it. There, a lot of people aren't wired that way. They want to be told what to do and you just do it. Mm. But if you can find the right people and you can get them together and give them the space to do it, great things can happen.